afternoon, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Dryden. I am a real estate partner at Urban Cone and Jessup in Beverly Hills. We are a full service law firm. I am also the co-chair of the real estate section of the Beverly Hills Bar Association. I am very excited for our program today, Homes Away from Home, Foreign Investment in U.S. Real Estate, presented by my partner and my friend, Vanya Hebekovic. Vanya is a partner in the corporate and tax departments of Irvin Cohen and Jessup. Vanya advises foreign investors on structuring to maximize their returns on buying, selling U.S. real estate. She also advises non-U.S. persons who already own U.S. real estate on how to transfer their real estate to the next generation. She handles complex 1031 exchanges. Vanya is currently structuring an exchange involving $300 million property where some part partners want to exit the deal while others want to undertake the 1031 exchange. Vanya also advises clients on how to structure transactions to avoid changes in ownership for property tax purposes, saving her clients from permanent increases to the property taxes. Vanya was recently named by the Los Angeles Business Journal as one of the most influential women attorneys in Los Angeles. Outside of work, Vanya hones her decision strategy skills at the poker table and is also a competitive pool player. So before I hand it over to Vanya though, I have a few housekeeping items. First of all, you should have received program materials in the reminder email that was sent about an hour ago. As we go on, I know this is a quiz format, but the questions do go both ways. So if you have questions for Vanya, please send them to me and the Q&A panel, and I will do my best to get them over to Vanya. And then finally, about an hour, or maybe, I think, excuse me, 24 hours after our presentation, you should receive your MCLE certificate. That will also include a survey, and we would really appreciate it if you complete that survey and let us know how we did. All right, without further ado, Vanya, take it away. Thank you for the kind introduction, Elizabeth. Um, it's great to be here today talking to all of you about foreign investment in U.S. real property. Thanks for taking the time. So how many of you have seen the movie Rounders? Um, by show of hands, there's a button you can press to show, show your hand. So raise your hand if you've seen the movie and I can see uh, how many of you have seen the movie Round Rounders. All right. <laughs> Okay, I'm seeing a bunch of you have seen it. Okay, good, good. Well, as Elizabeth mentioned, I love to play poker. And one of my favorite movies is the movie Rounders. So in the final scene of that movie, Mike, who's played by Matt Damon, is playing poker heads up against a Russian gangster, John Malkovich, to win back his life savings. Mike is dealt a hand that turns out to be the very best possible hand. In order to disguise the strength of his hand though, he doesn't bet at all. He just checks to the gangster and calls all of the bank gangsters bets. If Mike had let out by betting or raised or shoved all in, he would announce the strength of his hand. But by checking, he was able to seem weaker and the gangster continued to bet. In the end, the gangster pushes his chips all in because he's so convinced that Mike has a weak hand Mike, of course, calls and wins back all of his money. So the lesson here is that even when you're dealt the very best possible hand, if you don't play it right, you're going to leave money on the table. So a foreign investor with enough resources to buy real estate in the U.S. has a great hand to play, but you need to employ some tax strategies to avoid leaving money on the table. So... How many of you have represented a foreign buyer or seller in the past year? Raise your hands. Okay, let's see. Okay, a few of you, not too many. Um, well, if, if you haven't represented a foreign buyer or seller, I think you will soon. Even though there was, there was a slowdown in foreign buying of US real estate during the pandemic, I'm seeing the pace picking back up again. And the great news is these buyers are able to make all cash offers and they're buying expensive properties. So these are great buyers uh, for you to represent. So there's many tax implications for foreign owners buying and selling U.S. real estate and many opportunities to save your clients money and hassles. 
Today, I'm going to go over five tax and structuring considerations that come to mind when a foreign person is buying U.S. real estate. The goal isn't to make you an expert on these issues. What I'd like to do, though, is make you aware of and sensitive to the issues. This way, you're not surprised by questions from clients and you can avoid pitfalls. Um, you can present yourself as well informed and knowledgeable in the area. And uh, ultimately, in the end, I hope that the information will help you close your deals. So let's get started with a brief overview of the topics we'll be talking about today. So one, we're gonna go over US tax residency. This covers the issue of who exactly is a non-resident of the US and why it matters in real estate deals. Two, income taxes. Here we'll cover the basic tax issues that affect non-resident buyers and sellers. Three, estate and gift taxes. This is a hidden issue. Most people don't realize that U.S. estate and gift taxes can apply to non-U.S. persons, but they do. Uh, four, how to take title. We'll talk about the various ways a non-resident can take title to their property and the concerns that foreigners have when figuring out how to take title. Um, five is FERPTA withholding issues. Um, this topic addresses the tax withholding rules that apply when a non-resident is selling real property. So I promise that today's presentation would be in a quiz format. So you should have received a list of questions earlier. You get a point per correct answer, but lose a point if you get it wrong. Um, it's an honor system. So keep track of your points and the winner will get a prize. Um, the questions are, will be answered um, throughout the program through polls. So uh, like Elizabeth said, if you do have questions throughout the throat, the program, feel free to type them in the Q&A and Elizabeth will send them over to me as we go. So let's start with U.S. tax res residency. So why does it matter whether a U.S. person, whether a person is a U.S. resident? So it impacts how the person is taxed on their real estate and other dealings in the U.S. So that means it affects the advice you would provide to them on structuring their real estate deals. It's also possible for a person to become a U.S. tax resident inadvertently. So when you're dealing with a non-U.S. person who's starting to have significant contacts with the U.S., you need to be mindful of the possibility and impact to them of becoming a U.S. resident. So let's put up question one, Alex. All right. So question one, who is taxed on their worldwide income in the U.S.? Also, there can be more than one correct answer, so you should check all that apply. So A, the Queen of England, B, US citizens, C, Donald Trump, or D, resident aliens. So the answer is US citizens, Donald Trump, even though he may not actually pay the taxes, he is subject to tax on worldwide income in the US, and resident aliens. So, um, Alex, you can close the poll. Um, so U.S. citizens and resident aliens are taxed on the, their worldwide income. This means that they're taxed on all the money they earn wherever in the world they earn it. So if a U.S. citizen has a rental property in France, they're taxed in the U.S. on that rental income. Non-resident aliens are only taxed on their U.S. source income. So rental income and gain on the sale of U.S. real property is considered U.S. source and taxed here. Um, similarly, California residents are taxed on worldwide income, but non-residents are only taxed on California source income. And again, that would be rental income and gain on sale of, of California properties. So let's go on to question two, Alex. So what is a resident alien? A, a green card holder, B, an extraterrestrial being living among us, C, a Croatian model taking a seven-month seven vacation at his girlfriend's Malibu house, or D, a German backpacker traveling to the U.S. for the first time and staying two months. So I'll give you a second to answer the question. Um, so this is a little bit of a, a trick question. So the correct answers are the green card holder and also the Croatian model. 
And the reason is he meets the substantial presence test, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And so he's treated as a U.S. resident. So someone who's not a green card holder, not a U.S. citizen, and doesn't meet the substantial presence test will be a non-resident alien taxed only on U.S. source income. So you're going to want to ask your clients whether they're a citizen or green card holder and about their presence in the U.S. before giving them tax advice. So the substantial presence test counts the number of days that a person is physically present here in the U.S. So I'm simplifying the rule, but essentially it's if a person has 183 days of presence in the current and previous two years. Um, but a, a weighted formula is used for the prior years. So a good rule of thumb is if a person spends less than 121 days in the U.S. per year, then they won't meet the substantial presence test. So <clears throat> there are exceptions to that, and there are certain days that may not be counted, student, time spent on a student visa or uh, being here for medical conditions can override the general rules. But if your client says to you, I plan on spending more than six months here in the U.S. this year, you know they're going to meet the substantial presence test and you can let them know they may have an issue with being treated as a resident. Tanya, can I ask you a yes. question about that? Um, so then if you're, because it's, it's, I think it's pretty obvious if someone's like, I'm spending one month or I'm spending nine months, but once you get to that middle zone, what do you recommend the, you know, the alien, the rest, the potentially uh, non -resident? Yeah, so you have to count. You have to actually go through the past two years and the current year and see how many days they've spent in each of the years. And then you can advise the client and say, oh, this year you can only spend this many days here before you become a U.S. resident. Or is it like, like travel information? Like, Yeah, you can look at passports, their flight information, um, you know, keep a log. Um, but you really don't want your client to unwittingly become a U.S. resident right. under that test. Um, because they'll become taxed on worldwide income. And that makes clients... Yeah very yeah. unhappy. <laughs> so it's something I always ask a client who's buying real estate here uh, about, you know, how long are you planning on spending here? And, and I warn them about the possibility of becoming a U.S. tax resident if they spend too much time here. Mm -hmm. Great question. So <clears throat> let's go on to income taxes. So that's one of the first questions clients will ask you when they're investing you know, how am I going to be taxed on this investment? So gain on the sale of U.S. property and rental income is taxed in U.S. and California, and the precise rates depend on the way title is held. So let's talk about a few ways that title can be held and how that's going to impact the tax rates on your buyer. So one way is um, direct ownership. Your, your client might hold the property directly in their own personal name, or they may form a, a limited liability company of which they're the 100% owner. Uh, and LLC with one owner can be disregarded for tax purposes. So it's treated as direct ownership uh, for tax reasons. Um, so let's put up question number three. So a non-U.S. person holding U.S. real estate directly is A, not subject to U.S. tax, B, pays capital gain tax on a sale, C, pays 30% withholding tax on gross rental income, uh, D, can elect to pay tax at graduated rates on rental income. So I'll give you a second to answer. Again, there can be more than one answer. That's what I was going to ask you. Is this a <laughs> yes? All all of them can have more than one correct answer, and you should check all that apply. Really your teacher. Okay. One point one point for each correct answer. Okay. <laughs> so the answer is B, C, and D. Um, so if your client chooses direct ownership or single member LLC. They can get capital gains rates on a sale. Um, those rates are between 15 to 20% if you hold for more than a year. Um, 
they pay tax of 30% on gross rental income. That means gross without deductions, um, unless they make certain elections, in which case they can pay at graduated rates um, and they can take deductions. Um, you can take down the poll, Alex. Um, in California, um, there's no pre preferential capital gains rate. So uh, they'd still be subject, you know, potentially to tax at the maximum rate of 13.3. So this isn't my favorite structure uh, from an income tax perspective um, because a sale will also result in withholding under FERPDA, which we'll get to later. Uh, and also the person has to file individual U.S. tax returns in their own name. And most non-U.S. persons don't want to do that. And in California, too, right? If it's California. Yes, property. yes, absolutely. If it's a California property, that's right. Exactly. Um, so question four, please, Alex. So non-U.S. persons can engage in a Section 1031 exchange. True or false? And this one, there's only one right answer. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> so the answer here is it's true with some caveats. So first, the exchange can only involve U.S. real estate. So your client can't exchange its U.S. property for property in another country. Um, second, the property still needs to be held for investment or for use in a trade or business. So if the property is used for the client's personal purposes, so for example, the client buys a house uh, that they vacation in for two months every year and they never rent it out, uh, they may not qualify under 1031 because they haven't held it for the appropriate purposes. So <clears throat> another way to hold uh, the property is corporate ownership. So that's either an LLC that uh, you elect to be taxed as a corporation or an actual corporate entity. So let's put up question five, please. A foreign owned US corporation holding US real estate is A, a terrible idea. Real estate should never be held in a corporation. B, always results in double taxation, and C, is not eligible for capital gains tax rates. And this can have more than one correct answer as well. Okay, so the answer here is C, not eligible for capital gain tax rates. So a corporation doesn't get the 20% capital gains tax rate, but the current corporate tax rate on sale or rental income is only 21%. So there's only a slight difference between capital gains rates for individuals and the corporate rate. Um, this was much different in the past when the rates um, in corporations were 35%. Um, plus, there's an additional 8.84% in California um, on the corporation. But you may actually have a lower effective tax rate in California using a corporation because individual tax rates are higher in California than the corporate rates. And you can deduct all the state taxes uh, on your federal return, like the property taxes and the income taxes while individuals are subject to a $10,000 cap on those deductions. So at the current moment, you could get a better effective tax rate. I don't know what, the, what will be in the future when corporate tax rates go up, um, but we'll have to see. So this is not a structure I would use for US clients, um, but frequently use it for foreign clients. Typically, a U.S. client wouldn't want to hold in a corporation because of double taxation, which I'll talk about next. It can be difficult to transfer property in or out of a corporation without tax. Um, and also, as I mentioned, corporate tax rates might go up. Right now, they're very low historically. So corporations have what's known as a double layer of tax. That means there's a tax at the corporate level, at the entity level. And then again, at the shareholder level, when there's dividends. 
For a non-use person, these dividends are taxed at a 30% withholding rate. So it's a pretty high tax rate. But you can control the timing of dividends. So if it's a rental property, you can choose to keep the cash in the company so you don't incur that second level of tax. Um, if you just keep the cash in there and wait until you sell the property, you can pay the tax at the corporate level on the gain, liquidate the entity and not pay any further tax. So double taxation doesn't always apply. So for example, if you have um, real property, that's a residential home for your client, there's no rental income. So there would be no dividends in any event. Um, so you can just wait until the client sells the property and then liquidate the entity. So this is why I always have my non-US clients hold each property in a separate US corporation. Otherwise, you'd have to wait until all the properties were sold to liquidate and get out without the double taxation. So another structure your client might choose to invest in is the partnership or LLC form. So partnerships for tax purposes can be limited partnerships, general partnerships, LLCs with multiple members. And these are pass-through entities which means the gain on sale, rental income passes through to the partners and is taxed at the individual level. So Alex, can you put up question six, please? So a partnership or LLC with foreign partners members must withhold tax on distributions to the foreign partners. True or false? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a bit of a trick question. So the answer is actually false. There is withholding, but the withholding is on the profits, on their allocable share of income, not cash distributions. So huh. this, yes. So the withholding on the foreign partners is at 37% federally, which can really create a cash crunch for a partnership. So I've seen this come up where there's a partnership with both US and foreign partners. So let's say the partnership owns a rental property and they decide they want to reinvest the rental income to improve the property or pay off some debt or for reserves. Unfortunately, the partnership is going to have to withhold a large portion of the rental income and pay it over to the IRS on behalf of the foreign partners. Wow. So the partnership won't have enough cash for its needs. So there are some ways to deal with this. It's a little outside of the scope, but I wanted you to be aware of the issue if your clients want to form a partnership to hold the property. So you'll definitely have clients say, you know, oh, there, I heard taxes were really high in the U.S., um, I'm not sure I want to buy here. And you can respond that there's opportunities to reduce your taxes. You know, one thing to point out is that the 37% rate is the highest marginal tax rate for individuals. So it only applies if you're earning a lot of money. So if your client has a single rental property that's not making that much money, or if it's not a residential property not being rented at all, there won't be taxed until an ultimate sale. Vanya? If you're, yes. I was going to say, because I uh, I really liked the, the idea of having the, the corporation, having the corporation hold the income until the sale. But, and I think you were just kind of touching on this. What, what's a, the, what structure would you recommend if it's a foreign investor, non-resident that needs the rental income? So that's a tough one. Um, you know, a lot of times, at least in the early years, um, um, you know, the expenses are gonna offset the rental income. So it just makes sense to keep the cash there. Mm -hmm. It's a little tough, you know, it, you can sometimes get cash out if you need by, um, by doing loans to the shareholders, but you have to be really careful with that to make them respected for tax purposes. So that's one way you can do it. Um, but it has to be, you know, a real loan. Um, it's a little tough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
but I, I still would do a corporate form. I, I still, most clients don't want to be filing in their own name in the U S I have tax returns. Yeah, yeah. I've definitely found that with, with my foreign clients. They don't want to be on anything. They don't want to be listed on anything. Yes. No, exactly. Exactly. So also if your client's buying business or investment property, they can engage in tech and section 1031 exchanges. And like I said, there's no prohibition on non-U.S. persons taking advantage of that section. So in conclusion on the topic of income taxes, while tax does apply on rental and gain on sale, there are ways to plan and structure for it. So let's go on to gift and estate taxes. So this is a really a hidden issue because as I mentioned before, most people don't realize that a state or gift tax can apply to non-U.S. residents. It can even apply to gifts between non-U.S. residents. So put up question seven, please, Alex. Question seven. Inter vivos gifts of stock in a U.S. corporation by a foreign person are subject to gift tax. A, true if the gift is in excess of the exemption amount. B, true if the corporation owns real property. C, I'll accept that gift, it's tax-free. So again, this can have more than one correct answer. <laughs> All right, so the answer is C, I'll accept the gift, it's tax-free. So, for non-US persons, gift tax only applies to real property and tangible personal property, not intangibles. So a gift of a direct interest in US real property would be subject to gift tax, but if instead the real property is held in a US corporation, a gift of the stock isn't subject to gift tax regardless of the value. One thing to keep in mind, though, if this kind of gift is made, it can result in a change in ownership for property tax purposes and then uh, an increase in property taxes going forward. Let's go to question eight, please. My foreign grandmother died and left me her million dollar house in California. Is it subject to a state tax? A, yes, but only if the property is more than the exemption amount, so you don't have to worry about it. B, not if it's held in a U.S. corporation, or C, not if it's held in a foreign corporation. Again, more, more than one right answer, potentially. <laughs> I'm not tracking my points. I don't know how I would do on this. <laughs> <laughs> There's a prize at the end, so no. keep track. <laughs> I feel so, like it would be like collusion if I won, so. <laughs> That's true, fair. <laughs> so the answer here is C, not if it's held in a foreign corporation. Hmm. So a state tax applies to U.S. situs assets of non-U.S. persons, like real property that's situated here in the U.S. The estate tax rate is 40%, so... What that means is if a foreign person dies while holding U.S. real estate directly, the value of that real estate will be taxed at up to 40 percent. Unless the heirs have enough cash to pay that tax, the property will have to be sold in order to pay the IRS. So you might have a client say, well, I don't have to worry about that because my property is worth only a million dollars. And I know there's an exemption from a state tax of over 11 million dollars. And that's true. There is an exemption from estate tax. Uh, it's currently 11.7 million, but it only applies to U.S. residents and citizens. Foreigners only get a $60,000 exemption. So yes, the estate tax is applicable even to smaller property owners. So <clears throat> some clients, they might not have ever heard of the estate tax. Um, and if they have, you can let them know that there are ways to mitigate the estate tax exposure. So here's a few ways. One is taking title in the name of a foreign corporation. A foreign corporation 
its stock is not considered a U.S. Citus asset and not subject to a state tax. Although U.S. corporate stock is a U.S. Citus asset, so that would be subject to a state tax. This is why I typically have a U.S. corporation holding title to the real property and then a foreign corporation as the sole owner and then the foreign investor at the top. Um, another way the client might be eligible for benefits under a tax treaty that might reduce their estate tax exposure. And finally, the client can take out a life insurance policy in an amount equal to the estimated estate tax. So then when they die, their heirs get that life insurance proceeds in an amount sufficient for them to pay the estate tax. Then their heirs can hold on to the real property and they're not forced to sell uh, when their parent dies. Okay, so that brings us to our fourth topic, which is how to take title to real property. So you'll definitely have clients ask you how they should take title and there's competing concerns that need to be evaluated to determine the right structure. In any event, it's important to decide how to take title prior to close. Um, and as a practice point, even on the purchase agreement, um, if no entities have been formed at that time, I like to say the purchaser is, you know, the foreign individual and or its assinees. Uh, so there's no issue with assigning the agreement to the entity uh, that turns out to be the buyer. So you definitely want to make decisions on title, how you'll hold title before close, because subsequent transfers can result in gift tax and they may have California property tax implications. So like we previously discussed, a transfer of real property held directly is subject to gift tax in the U.S., um, so if your client really wants their child to own the property, that should be planned in advance. So there's not a gift tax issue. I see this a lot where, um, uh, a child is going to attend UCLA and the parents want to buy a house for the child while they're going to school and ultimately want the child to own. Um, sometimes it's better, um, to either put, put the property in the name of the child to begin with. Or again, you then might want um, a U.S. corporate structure so that the, the interest can be transferred later gift free. Another thing to think about is subsequent transfers can result in a reassessment for property tax, um, especially when a transfer takes place a few years later and the property has appreciated or in this market a few months later because everything's appreciating like crazy. So um, you want to be careful about that because a later transfer could result in a significant increase in property tax. And that's an ongoing expense for the entire time the person owns the real property. So it's a real issue. So the stru structuring options you have are direct ownership, LLC, corporation, partnership, whether it's LP or GP. S corporation is not available because you can't have non-US shareholders of S corporations. Um, you can add a foreign corporation at the top of any of the structures I mentioned um, for the state tax, um, rather than having the non-US person as a direct owner. So let's put up question nine, please. So what issues do foreign investors care about when buying U.S. real estate? A, zip code. B, tall hedges for privacy. C, limited liability. D, taxes. So again, there could be multiple, <laughs> multiple correct answers. <laughs> like so here... All of these are issues uh, that foreign investors care about when buying U.S. real property. So let's talk about privacy a little bit. So title to real estate is public record in the U.S. In other countries, that's not the case necessarily. So you might have a government official or other public figure or even just someone who's wealthy and they don't want people to know where they live or that they own property in the US even. Non-US buyers are also worried about US tax 
filing obligations and obtaining a tax ID number. The IRS is a big and scary entity for non-US taxpayers and US taxpayers yes, too, hey. but <laughs> non-US taxpayers in particular don't like the idea of having to file returns in their own personal name. The next concern of many foreign investors is limited liability. So the US has a reputation for being very litigious. Clients are concerned about getting sued. Um, this is especially an issue if you own multiple properties and if the property is being rented out. So for example, you could have a tenant slip and fall and sue the client. But even with a personal residence, if the client has household staff, there's a risk of being sued. I had a client's housekeeper sue uh, after she fell off the ladder. So it's, it's definitely a real issue. Um, and the last issue uh, I see coming up is the income and estate tax issue. So direct ownership or single member LLC expose the client to estate and gift tax. Um, and in addition, they have to file them individual tax returns. Foreign corporate ownership through a US corporation, which is my preferred structure, eliminates the estate and gift tax issue, but potentially results in a double layer of taxes, especially in the scenario that Elizabeth mentioned where there's an active rental property and they wanna be taking money out. Um, this can be mitigated excuse me, mitigated by holding until liquidation uh, and potentially with loans um, to shareholders. So I <clears throat> has a question. Yeah, yeah sure. Here, but because I, I do know that the, the privacy issue is a huge concern and people don't want to be the signatory. They don't want to have that filed uh, or recorded, right? Uh, is there any way to get around it really? Or what have, what have you been able to do? So sometimes I've had, um, uh, sometimes the foreign client might have an attorney that they use abroad and they might appoint that attorney as an officer or manager of an entity and give that person signature authority. Mm -hmm. So then that person can sign rather than the individual owner of the, the entity. Yeah, I don't that, that's one way. Yeah, I don't really see another way around it other than doing something like what you said, just finding somebody else and just authorizing them to, to sign. And then I guess you would do that, whatever that author authorization would look like, you'd probably want it to be pretty narrow. Yes, exactly, exactly. And, you know, if it's someone, you know, I obviously advise the client, you, you want that person to be someone that you trust very much if you give them that authority. Um, but yeah, you can do a very narrow power of authority. Um, you know, I, I like to see the authorization in the organizational documents because um, escrow and title are going to want to confirm signature authority. And um, I've also even seen, um, you know, kind of going up the chain, they'll look through if there's a foreign corporation owner, they'll want an opinion on, you know, who's the authorized signatory for that entity. So, um, you know, if you have a structure that involves non-US persons, I definitely would be talking to title and escrow early to let them know, um, because they're going to ask for uh, certain documents. Mm -hmm. So, so let's say a client comes to you and they say they're concerned about all of these issues and they ask you how I sh should take title. Um, you can let them know that there's a variety of ways to structure to address the concerns. So if you hold in the name of an LLC or a corporation that's owned by a foreign corporation and the LLC elects to be taxed as a US corp, um, you get limited liability there and you get a lot more privacy than direct ownership. It also alleviates the state and gift tax issues. But again, you know, if it's an act of rental property, you have some issues with distributions going back out to the owners. Um, as I mentioned also for limited liability, we often put the real property in separate LLCs. Um, that way, if there's a lawsuit on one property, the other properties are safe. And this works very well on the tax side because on a sale of the property, the entity can be liquidated without further tax. So no double tax, just tax at one level on the gain. 
And, and going back to privacy, uh, statements of information in California uh, for California LLCs require disclosure of either the names of the members or the names of the managers. And for California corporations, you have to disclose the names of the officers and directors. So you still have to be careful as the name of the owner can be revealed on these statements. Um, but again, maybe you can use a trusted advisor um, to serve in those roles. Um, I, I don't serve in those roles personally because there is that liability of be, being an officer, director, or manager of an entity uh, that I don't want to take on. Um, also with regard to privacy, FinCEN, that's the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, requires title insurance companies to report the owners behind legal entities who are involved in high-end cash real estate transactions in LA and other major cities. So while this isn't public information, it is information that needs to be provided um, and title will not close the deals without the information. I mean, they're required by law to gather it. Um, there's also a new um, uh, recently enacted Corporate Transparency Act, which would require disclosure of the beneficial owner of entities Regulations haven't yet been enacted, um, but this may ultimately limit some privacy benefits of entity ownership. Um, Vanya, I, actually, this is interesting. I, I haven't heard of the what is it called? The Fin FinCEN. FinCEN is that is that if there's a, a if the you know the property is a, a price point is above a certain amount. Yes, and I you know I can't remember the price point off the top of my head, but it's only if it's a cash transaction. So if it involves a loan. Um, it will be okay. I, I mean, I think the idea is, you know, the lender does its diligence um, and the KYC rules there. Right. Um, and different cities um, have different thresholds for this. This has been around for, for a while now. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I've had to submit these forms um, frequently um, on these deals. So yeah, it definitely comes up. Um, so, you know, if, if your client ultimately doesn't want to own through an entity, you can own directly and you can get liability insurance. Um, you know, that will help on the liability side. Um, I, I still prefer an LLC or corporation and it won't provide for any privacy or avoid the gift or estate tax issues. So to conclude on this, there's no one size fits all approach in determining how to take title. It really depend, depends on the client's concerns and the type of property being purchased, whether it's rental or buy and hold, but there are solutions and ways to address it. So let's go on to our final topic, which is FERPTA withholding. So what is FERPTA? That stands for the Foreign Investment and Real Property Tax Act. So FERPTA requires buyers of US real estate who are buying from foreign sellers um, in other words, the non-resident aliens or foreign corporations um, that we talked about before. Uh, and the buyers have to withhold 15% of the sales price of the real property. Um, question 10, please, Alex. So FERPTA withholding on the sale of a million dollar property that was purchased for $900,000 is... A, $150,000, B, $15,000, or C, zero, if the real property is owned by a U.S. corporation. Okay, so the answer here is both A and C. So if real property is owned by a U.S. corporation, then it's not a sale by a foreign person even if all the shares of the corporation are owned by a non-US person. But keep in mind a sale of the shares as opposed to the underlying real estate would be subject to FERPTA, uh, but you really wouldn't see that structure. No buyer is gonna buy the shares of a, a corporation. So um, if, if the property is held directly, then the withholding is $150,000. And that may be a little bit Surprising because the withholding tax is in excess of the gain on the sale. So the withholding is on the gross proceeds from the sale, not the gain. So 
here in my example, the withholding is much more than the gain and much more than the tax that will ultimately be owed. Um, in addition, California law requires withholding on foreign sellers of three and a third percent. So that's an addition. Um, I had a broker uh, who recently lost a sale because they didn't warn their foreign seller about withholding. Mm. Um, the sale agreement for was for over $5 million. And a few days before close, escrow said that the withholding was going to be close to a million dollars. And all of a sudden the seller realized she wouldn't be able to pay off her loan and have enough funds to buy the next property she wanted. So it's, it's, Definitely an issue you want to warn your clients about up front so they can plan. Um, and there's also some exemptions from withholding and ways to get your money back. So one way uh, um, the seller can get a refund of over withheld amounts. So the withholding is not the actual tax owed, but it's applied against the tax due. So once the seller finds, uh, files their U.S. tax return, um, they can get a refund of the overwithheld amount. Um, two, a seller can potentially get their money back faster with a withholding certificate. So a seller can apply for a withholding certificate from the IRS. And in that case, escrow has to withhold the tax, but doesn't actually have to pay over to the over the tax to the IRS. Once the IRS issues the certificate, which IRS says it's usually around 90 days, escrow can then disperse the withheld amounts. So this gets the money back to the seller faster in case of a sale that happens early in the year. So let's say you have a sale in January, the seller can't file their return until the next tax year. And so they won't get a refund for over 12 months. But if the sale is in December, the seller might not go through the trouble of filing a withholding certificate because they can go ahead and file their tax return the next month and get their refund. Another way to avoid FERPTA is to take title in the name of a U.S. corporation to begin with. And, you know, sale by a U.S. corporation wouldn't be subject to FERPTA. And if you plan far enough and ahead, uh, far enough ahead, you could potentially transfer title to the name of the U.S. corporation prior to the sale to mm -hmm. avoid uh, the FERPTA withholding. But well, again, part well, of I was gonna say we actually are getting questions about that, about about that just the structure you're talking about right now about having a foreign person transferring it to U.S. corporation to avoid that withholding. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because I I feel like that you said you have to plan ahead. I feel like if it happened too closely together, the IRS would just collapse it, right? Yeah, I mean, that can be an issue, you know, absolutely. Um, but, you know, there are real non-tax business purposes for holding in a corporate entity, mm. which, you know, namely is the limited liability. So you know, you might want to hold in an entity prior to sale because of limited liability, you know, after a sale, we know that things can come back, you know, to a seller. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I don't love to have, you know, a transfer on the eve of sale. Um, you know, but in the end, you know, I guess if the IRS collapsed it, you know, by that time, it, you know, the foreign corporate or the US corporation has paid its taxes, um, you know, I, I'm not sure if there's any, you know, additional tax the IRS would be collecting. You know, the, the idea of FERPTA is so that, you know, non-U.S. persons can't get out of paying their tax on the sale. And so they try and collect it in advance. Um, but, yeah, you want to give enough time to, you know, form the entity, do the contribution, you have to make sure the contribution structured properly. Okay. So it's gonna, not a taxable event there. So I'm going to um, ask you a question, which I would hate to have asked of me. So I apologize if I'm backing you to a corner right now. Um, and I know, and I'm asking you this question with the understanding that all of these things are so, you know, the, they're really are fact specific, uh, but ballpark. I mean, do you think you would feel safe if you did it three months before a sale? Like where would you feel 
kind of more comfortable. Yeah. I mean, I would definitely feel much better if we didn't have a sales contract already signed. Oh, good. But, you know, with the existing, you know, owner. Um, yeah, I, I would feel better about that. Um, yeah, no contract, you know, not having entered, signed up with a broker yet. Um, yeah, I, I would feel better um, in that scenario. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, I think the point is, you know, you want to warn your clients so they're, they aren't surprised about the FERPTA withholding and some planning can be done. I mean, ideally, you've, you represented them from the beginning um, and uh, then you can structure it how you want it structured from the very start. Right. Um, but if not, you know, there's still some things that can be done to, to address the issues. So I wanted to go over just a couple very practical items. Um, can you put up question 11, please, Alex? My great client is about to sell uh, real property he owns through a US corporation. I've told him it's okay to get the grant deed notarized in Greece since he's vacationing at, in Mykonos at the moment. That's okay, right? Yes, no problem or yikes. Okay, so the answer here is yikes. Um, title companies will demand the grant deed be notarized with a US notary. So this either requires the client to come to the US or they can also go to a US embassy to get notar notarization. But the appointments can take time to make, uh, especially during pandemic, it was problematic. So make sure to get the grant deed signed early so you don't delay a close on this issue. And then can you put up question 12, please? Wait, Bonnie, can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. Um, just because I, you know, just so that we're all on the same, same page. Um, that's, you know, for a sale, obviously there's a grant deed. I, I'm trying, I'm like mentally scrolling through my you know, list of documents from the buy side. I, I don't think there would be the same issue. No, on the buy side, it's not something to worry about. Um, you know, every once in a while you get some weird requirements from an escrow or title company just because the person's non-US. Right. But um, the, the only thing that's really problematic is, is the grant deed. Okay. And, you know, I've been successful also where they have a trusted advisor in the States and I have them grant power of attorney, a, you know, a very limited power of attorney to that U.S. person to sign uh, when we've been in a, a crunch. Um, but for that, you know, the, the title company wanted the, the power of attorney notarized in Greece. Um, so there was still an effort uh, that had to be made to get it done. So... Question 12. So now that the real property is sold, my Greek client wants the proceeds sent straight to him in Greece since he never opened a bank account in the U.S. for his corporation. That's OK, right? Sure. Just tell title where you'd like the check directed or no way. So the answer here is no way. Um, title will only send the check in the name of the seller of the property. Even though the client is the sole shareholder of the corporation, they will not send a check in any other person's name. Uh, in this case, my client had to open a U.S. bank account just to receive the proceeds. Uh, and this can be time consuming um, with the bank KYC rules. So that's something to prepare for. Um, and I've seen clients, you know, just who never get around to opening a U.S. bank account for their entities. Vanya, so keep... Yeah, that seems like, especially right now, I've been, I've been experiencing this with my U.S. clients when we're opening, you know, uh, controlled accounts. Uh, it's taking a very long time for the U.S. clients to get through KYC. So I would imagine yes. really once, I assume once you go hard, you just need to start working on that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I but mean, for this particular deal. But when they you just start... Yeah, once you know you're going to sell the property. Yeah, well, we didn't have an, a bank account at the time of close, so we just had them send us a check that we held until the bank account was open. Oh, I don't like that. Yeah, I did not like that at all. <laughs> so now that we've gone through the top five tax uh, and structuring issues I see when representing foreign buyers and sellers, 
I hope this helps you to be better prepared when representing these clients so that your clients don't leave money on the table when they have a great hand to play. So as for the quiz, the maximum score is 21 points for the quiz. So if anyone has 21 points, please send a message in the chat and I'll see uh, if there's more than one of you. I might have to do a tiebreaker later. Oh, it looks like there's only one. Wow. Wow. Okay. Neil, it looks like Neil, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to butcher this last name. Chilingirian uh, is the winner. Um, Neil, if you want to send me an email so I have your contact information and I will get you out your prize, which is a nice bottle of wine or alcohol. Do you want to? So thanks again, everyone, for Please. joining. If there's any other questions, I think we might have a couple more minutes. Do you want to put your email in the chat, Vanya? Oh, yeah. Okay. So that way he doesn't have to go searching for you. Let me do that. Okay. <laughs> oh, and I have his. I'll keep his. Great. Here, I just sent it. Excellent. Perfect. All right. Well, I, I appreciate everyone's time today. And if, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to follow up with me directly. If anything comes up, uh, always happy to help. Well, thank you so much, Vanya. It's been, uh, it's been really fun. I feel like I have learned a lot, just enough to be dangerous. And I appreciate it. <laughs> um, and as always, thank you to the Beverly Hills Bar Association. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. everyone.